This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Do you want to dig into Chapter 24, an embassy? Let's do it. The symbol is the Flame of Tarvalon. And I don't think we need to talk much about this at all. The embassy is the embassy from the what the White Tower to yeah. Rand. And we've got the symbol of the Aes Sedai. Very straightforward. Very straightforward. Turning away from the musicians on the street corner, a perspiring woman puffed at a long flute, and a red-faced man plucked a nine-string bittern. Egwene threaded her way through the crowd with a light heart. The sun stood high in the sky, molten gold, and the paving stones were hot enough to burn through the soles of her soft boots. Sweat dripped from her nose. Her shawl felt like a heavy blanket, even looped loosely over her elbows, and there was enough dust in the air that she already wanted to wash. Yet she smiled. Some people eyed her askance when they thought she was not looking, which almost made her laugh. That was how they looked at the Aiel. People saw what they expected to see, and they saw a woman in Aiel garb, never noticing her eyes or her height. And so this is just, we have a Egwene in Camelin who has been gone fully native to the Aiel. Yeah, so I guess she was being kept out of the city at first because of her sickness, and now they finally let her go in. Yeah, and for a while she was, like, running around it, and she convinced them that running through it was just as effective as running around it. Yeah. Because she, like, missed missed people. Yeah, bad decision. That's how she's going to meet Gawain. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. That's a huge debate. Yeah. Oh, man. We, uh, we into the... Um, the men's viewing ones, we actually got into that a little bit during the, the panel. Uh, okay, I'll have to watch fun. that. As to what exactly, how, how big is a disaster is it that Egwene and Gawain got together? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always disliked Gawain, but I'm also a fan of characters I dislike, if that makes sense. Sure, they're well, they are well-written characters. Yeah. You know, badly written characters don't make you feel anything. Right. So he's well-written, he's just well written to be a douche indeed because <laughs> uh, just his hypocriticalness with like specifically like in the early books where he's like you can't base anything off rumors and then later he's like randall thor killed my mother because of rumors right You're like oh you asshole and many more <laughs> yeah and then there's that's just the the, the the first of many i am a birder i i, I do a lot of bird watching and so I had to note that in that first paragraph, as you read in, he mentions a musical instrument called a nine-string bittern. And a bittern is a bird. Hmm. And it's a really cool bird, actually. It's kind of like a heron. And it walks uh, really slowly. And, you know, it's described in a lot of the bird books as having an agonizingly slow gait. Um, so it's a really cool bird. But I think here he's talking, you know, he's not referencing the bird, obviously. I think here he's uh, talking about an instrument that's called a cittern in real life. And I don't know much about instruments, so I could be wrong, but... You know, I, I kind of assumed it, like they were the same thing. I didn't realize that a bittern was a bird and that the cittern was the musical instrument. Yeah. I wonder if that's a typo. I don't know. That's a good question. Now, I think it shows up somewhere else in the series, though, because I believe that there's like a 12-string bittern somewhere else as well but they've that's fascinating they've also had multi typos in the past as well so <laughs> so i'm just doing a quick search i'm finding a lot of bitterness but not a lot of no oh, here's one figures mounted uh so in chapter nine they mentioned bitterns okay as a musical instrument does it say how many strings no okay Cluster of musicians in white embroidered little blue tabards with flutes and bitterns and tambours. Gotcha. If it is a if it is a typo, it's a typo he's made in multiple places. I'm guessing it's just kind of like a on purpose. And fifty three, chapter fifty three, bitterns and dulcimers. Okay. So, in his world, at least, a bittern. Yeah. yeah. Is a nine string instrument. It was interesting to me, just being a birder. I was like, immediately like, what? The bird? What? <laughs> but you're right. The one, two, three. The cittern has nine strings. Oh, okay. Weird. So now I'm really confused as to whether that's a typo or not, or whether he just changed the name of it in, in Randland. Yeah, I would guess it's he purposefully changed it just slightly for, for Randland. But good catch. Good catch. I'd, n I'd never caught that before. 
I thought I thought a bittern was that instrument. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't think about it, uh, it just seems like it's like some kind of instrument you haven't heard of or something. Right, right, right. And I, I feel like you either have to be a birder to catch that reference, which, okay, <laughs> or a musician, in which case you'd know it was a sittern. Right, a right, yeah. Well, uh, I don't have a lot in the very beginning of this chapter. Basically a bunch of people thinking that she is Aiel. Yeah, I noticed they made a quick mention of the uh, Karahinians, I don't know how to pronounce that. Karianans. Karianans, who are uh, kind of starting to follow G.E. Toe or a bastardized version of it. Right, because they're using the sword, but it's what they think of honor. And those later become Fael's right. spies, right? Yeah, Cha, Cha Fael or something. Cha Fael, yeah. right, because they end up going with Perrin to help rescue Rand, and then Fael ends up taking them under her wing. Right, which I always kind of like that whole the way that goes, that's kind of neat. Mm-hmm. I love the way Fael uh, generates a spy system mm-hmm. for her parent. She just kind of like scoops these aimless people up and... Totally. All right, let's go. <laughs> and that does seem to be necessary for every single one of these uh, you know, kingdoms. You need a network of spies to feed you information, mm. right? Or else you're just going to be clueless. Yeah. Um, I had... I just thought it was kind of interesting that Egwene is sort of practicing her stern looks. She's picked up from, you know, first the Aes Sedai and then the Wise Ones, and she's going to be using them a lot coming up here soon. <laughs> I mean, she is inherently a Wise One, right? She she right. Is, thinks of herself as one. Good example here is she starts to lecture somebody on the, the ways of G.E. Toe, and she's like, oh, right, yeah. I'm, and, and lectures them not on, like, beating a man up, but on beating him up as a group rather than <laughs> right. at a time. I thought that's like, that's funny. so Aiel. So Aiel. Yep. Yeah. We get a timeline here that this has been six days since Mangan hanged. So we know it's been six days since Rand fled Camelon uh, and came yeah. back to Kyrian. That part always kind of bugged me is, you know, we see a lot in these books. And it's also kind of a fantasy theme where people, when they pass judgment like that, they take responsibility and they like see to it themselves. And we see Rand here just, you know, going, all right, go ahead and. Do it. I'm, I'm taking off to Camelon. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a possibly a mistake. But at the same time, you know, he makes a, a point here that, like, that's the law. Yeah. You know, and I'm not making anything special for him just because he's my friend. He broke the law. Right. And, you know, I, I think it's a very important point for him to say, you know, the law is more important than my personal friendships or my opinions. Yeah. And I mean, it seemed to work out well for him politically that way, but it, it did seem to be kind of a direct, directly going against that fantasy trope. Oh, sure. Yeah. No. And I, I like that it's written in there of like, well, if you want to say fantasy trope, I mean, that is, that is the point of Ned Stark. Yeah, totally. Is, you know, if you condemn a man, you take his head yourself. Right, and they've they've had that theme in the Wheel of Time with other characters, like Elaine uh, speaks about it mm-hmm. for sure at some point. I don't remember when, but I think Perrin Perrin even comes to the similar conclusion. Yeah, I think you're right. So yeah, it's interesting. You, you could see this as as Rand in some way not dealing with his shit. Right, he is walking away from his problems rather than dealing with them or confronting them. And that, I feel like that's true for a lot of what's going on. Because, like, every time he runs into Avienda, instead of dealing with her, he runs away to a different city. Right. <laughs> Which doesn't work at all, but... No, it doesn't. So he's just running away from his problems, and this is just another example of that. Yeah. Running away from Mangan. He seems to be in a little bit of a phase of that through these couple of chapters here, just kind of, like, going, ooh, I'm just going to hop over here and get out of this one. Ah, oh, dang, now there's more over here. Uh, let's go back over there. <laughs> Well, and that chaotic, chaotic loss, that chaotic lack of a plan feeds directly into his kidnapping. Yeah, right. That's really a setup for that, for sure. They're like, oh, well, he just left again like he usually does. Right. And so, and so no one looked for him for days and days and days. And if Perrin hadn't had that Tavirin tugging that, that, you know, helped him find the sword and... Mm-hmm. Well, I guess technically Barrelane found the sword. Oh, right. Yeah. Speaking of Barrelane... That one was only interested in men who were alive. <laughs> Which is true. Yes. Egwene and Berlaine do not get along. No. Egwene thinks of her morally as a bad person. And she's so perplexed right now. Like, why does she get along with the wise ones? She doesn't get it at all. <laughs> no, she doesn't. 
She doesn't. Because the wise ones don't have the same Puritan values that Egwene does, and so they don't they see Barrelane's actual competent leadership and the way she's able to like manipulate bigger countries and you know, she doesn't do everything right, but she respects Ruark as a father figure. Mm. And these wise ones are married to Ruark, so they see her as a daughter. Right. Almost in the literal sense. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, but Egwene is just like not having it. What is going no, on? No, she has no idea what's going on. She may be Aiel, but she's not that Aiel. I see that. I saw that she runs into an illuminator there. And I was just kind of wondering if that's anyone we've seen before. You know, it could be that Tammuz that. Tammuz, yeah. yeah. Possibly. I didn't see any evidence for that, but. Not really, but we don't know what happened to him. No, we don't. No. As far as I can tell, Tammuz is no longer, you know, doesn't appear after the Dragon Reborn. Right. And the, the same thing in the Companion. Yeah. Well, I'll head cannon. It was to moose. We'll just pretend. I, I kind of did too, just because I was like, eh, might as well. <laughs> might as well. Do you think any of these... Uh, there's a couple of women in blue dresses. We, we see some era felons with bells in their hair. And I was just trying to find any connection to anyone we know. And to be honest, it, it seems like she's just listing off people she sees. Yeah. You know, just random examples of their countrymen. I, I think so. You know, there. so one thing I thought about is... There were a few of the uh, of Elida's embassy who are mm-hmm. secret, like so they're like just newly raised, so they don't have the ageless faces yet. Right. And so I was right. kind of looking around for them in this chapter, but I didn't really see any of them. Uh, I like here that she's thinking about if only there were some way to heal the tower. She's uh, to make it whole again without bloodshed. She's already thinking about like ways to bring the tower together before she's Emerald Seat. That's exactly. Yep. No. Yeah. I was thinking the exact same thing. Taking on the responsibility of Amaryllin Seat before she's doing it. Right. Um, the other thing I kind of liked along those same lines, right, just a little bit after that, is she's hearing the rumor that Sue Ann and Sally and started about Loghain. Right. Yeah. And she's so angry about it, which is funny because then, it be, you know, after it, here shortly, it'll be part of her, <laughs> her charge. strategy. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think she would be okay if it was just the Red Aja. The problem is people don't really understand the Ajas, so they're just like, oh, it's the whole White Tower. Right, yep. And then I think not too long after that, that's when she notices the embassy, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a little bit about her walking through the crowd, and there's some rumors um, about Dylan taking over. Mm, Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, we can go into these, but they're all just like rumor fades to myth type situations, and none of them are super accurate. They're all based on things that are happening, but not actually happening. Yeah. Is this... She's got a better idea of what's going on than, than the rumors do. So the next thing I have is her confrontation with the guys beating up the shopkeeper, and her little have you no honor. Yeah. <laughs> and her realization that she confronted them as an Aiel, not as a wetlander. Very effectively, too. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, it's sort of her final leveling up just showing that she is as confident as a as a wise one before yeah. she gets recruited to be the emerald seat it's kind of interesting because she kind of goes back and forth when you're in her head here she's like kind of oh i'm scared like a somebody from the white tower might find me or this or that could happen uh, and then she's like oh wait a minute i'm in a clothing and then she gets her confidence all back and then she ends up doing this <laughs> right well, she's she's fairly well hidden, right? If everyone thinks she's Aiel, they're not going to suspect her as being Aes Sedai. She doesn't have the angel's face, obviously. She hasn't sworn on the oath rod. Yeah. You know, so as far as they can tell, she's just a young Aiel woman with light eyes. Perfect disguise. Especially because she knows how to pull it off now. Yeah, and, and who the hell is going to be able to tell the Aiel apart, right? Like, only other Aiel. We, we, hear, we see that a lot, where, like, Aiel can tell each other apart, like, which clan they're in, mm. but no one else can. Yeah. That's why they, they make them wear the red armbands in one of the battles. Maybe, like, some random brown or something. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like Amisa's uh, advice, or Sorelia's advice to uh, Berylaine. You should not depend on Rurik so much, girl. Randall Thor gave you Kyrian to tend. Let most men have a finger, and they will have the whole hand before you know. Let a clan chief have a finger, and you will have the entire arm. Because, like, like, she is in charge, but she is using Rourke to maintain that. So, yeah, then after, I guess, while she's kind of busy with the being, you know, with those guys, that's when she sees the embassy. 
She did not recognize the dozen or so green cloaked soldiers forcing a path through the crowd, but who they escorted was a different matter. She could only see the backs of the women, five or six, she thought, between the soldiers, just parts of their backs, but that was more than enough, much more. The women wore light dust cloaks, pale linen, and shades of brown, and Egwene found herself staring at what seemed to be a pure white disc embroidered on the back of one of those cloaks. Only the stitching picked out the white flame of Tarbalan from the border, signifying the white Aja. She caught a glimpse of green, of red. Red! Five or six Aes Sedai, riding towards the royal palace, where a copy of the dragon banner weighed fitfully atop the step tower alongside one of Rand's crimson flags, bearing the ancient Aes Sedai symbol. Some called that the dragon banner, and others Althor's banner, or even the Aiel banner, and a dozen other names besides. So we got a, oh, some reds, some whites, no blues. Yeah, no blues. <laughs> Green. Yeah, and boy, I would, if, I mean, if I was in her shoes, I'd be freaking out right then. Oh, totally, yeah. So I did look up the embassy just a little bit to kind of see what she's looking at here. And I, get, I guess there were 39 total Aes Sedai in the embassy, which I guess I wow. didn't really remember there were that many. I don't, didn't either, yeah. Yeah. So there were 33 in the encampment, and, and then six that camped separate, and they were the ones that, you know, actually go into the discussions to kind of hide the true numbers. And who were those six? Do you have those names? Oh, I didn't write those ones down. I didn't, I didn't know how much we were going to get into that now. Uh, the ones I did write down were the ones that didn't have the ageless faces yet, mm. just because I wanted to look for them in the chapter, but I didn't, I didn't find them, so... <laughs> But yeah, there were five that didn't have ageless faces yet. And all five of them, three of them after Dumai's Wells end up getting, becoming Dotsong and then getting, uh, you know, Varen, uh, com- compulsed by Varen. And then they end up at, you know, the cleansing, um, or at least one of them did. And then the other two end up escaping back to the tower and they get like relegated to that little town on uh, one of the bridges oh one of the bridge towns yeah to hide you know to kind of hide what happened oh stupid elida and her terrible plans oh yeah so that they show up again when the younglings are around you know in those towns are they in the last battle i i don't think so but some of the ones that are at the cleansing do end up at the last battle um one of them was killed in the last battle the other two weren't. It didn't mention that. Gotcha. Yeah, S- Sanderson definitely let some of the Aes Sedai just sort of be like, "Well, they're ta- part of the Tower Aes Sedai." Just assume. But yeah, so out of the out of those thirty nine, there thirteen were red. Oh wow! Well, well, figures. How many were black? That's the question. Well, yeah, I didn't count that. That would have been a good one to yeah. count. Probably more than one. Definitely more getting than one. Getting barren. <laughs> That's, yeah, I like, Bambi's like, getting barren is a verb. And I'm like, yep, that, I think we're going to have to use that one from now on. <laughs> now, there's a couple of mentions here where she starts talking about Rand traveling. And I think yeah. that's foreshadowing for her. You know, she's trying to puzzle out, like, now that she knows it's possible, she's like, okay, if he figured it out, I should be able to figure it out. And that leads to her figuring out the whole... Entering Teleron Riyadh in the flesh. Right, the sort of half-traveling. Yeah, which I always think of that as... So I think skimming is the same thing as entering the dream in the flesh. The only difference is you're skimming through an empty part of the dream world rather than a full part. Right. I, I mean, that, that seems right to me. And that all Egwene is doing is using Bella as her skimming platform. Right, a very slow skimming platform. Very slow skimming platform. And she's, like, letting the world exist around her. But yeah, I always thought that, that traveling happened in sort of an empty part of Teleron Riyadh. Or a part where, like, it doesn't have an exact reflection. Or maybe even that sort of black space that we're in between the dreams or in between the spokes of the wheel or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, whatever that black space is. Yeah, so Egwene is puzzling over that and... uh Avienda is at this same time period. It's not mentioned in this chapter, but throughout this these couple of chapters here, she's also seeing Rand travel and going like, okay, I did this once. How do I do that again? Although I'm not sure she ever figures it out again until it's taught to her. That's right. But she really wants to because she wants to go to Elaine. Right. And she's really trying to figure out how to get there. Yeah. And we see that shortly. She uses, she uses Rand to get there. Exactly, yeah. 
she, she tags along. Um, as we know, she's got the two kinds of toe, and she can only deal with that with Lane. She has to apologize for sleeping with Rand, basically. Right. Yeah, you know, there's that whole line where she's like, oh, I could kill myself, or I could kill Rand. <laughs> yeah, well, one, one would solve one toe, one would solve the other, but they prevent the other one from happening. And the first time I, I read that, I was like, what the heck is going on here? I was just as clueless as Rand. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's accurate yeah yeah i feel that way no now i know is that that you know really what she needed is lane to be her sister wife that was the solution yeah her sisters however you want to call it so she she sees the embassy she runs right back to the wise ones to tell them there's an embassy and bear lane goes off to find ruark and then you know to try and establish try and prevent from being surprised, right? Because I'm sure the Tower Wise ones wanted to pop in and be like, we're here, and have everyone scramble. Right. And so having the the advance notice is helpful, just on a political level. That worked out well. Although, you know, they still don't really know the whole magnitude of what's going on here. No, not the kidnapping or anything like that. That takes a while. I mean, this is this is just the setup for it. Yeah, and with with 39 of them there, I mean, you know, I don't in the narrative we never see nearly any of those. No, no, very few. I mean, they're in the battle, and I think that's important. Right. But um they essentially become the wise ones apprentices, right? Yeah, dot song and then eventually once they, you know, dig their way out of that, they either get Varen or they become wise ones apprentices. Do you have anything to say about sort of Barrelane and the wise ones? Not a whole lot that we haven't already said. Or how about Berylane and Egwene? <laughs> Same. They do not like each other. Yeah, they don't like each other, but I just kind of, you know, I guess I'm kind of used to that. I don't really have much to say about it. Oh, Bambi, I think all of the Embassy were aware, were aware of Galena's plan. At least the kidnapping. Yeah. No, we didn't cover that. But I do, I do think that they all decided... it was It was this contingency plan where the one was like, the Grey was given an opportunity to negotiate and everyone knew that she had an opportunity and if that failed then galena took over and everybody knew that galena was going to be the leader and so the only reason that would have happened is if they decided yeah we're going to kidnap him instead of negotiating with him so i i can't imagine that not everybody was at least somewhat aware of that plan at least the i said i anyway that's the way i took it too i think that they all, all you know all 39 of them are in on that and right Maybe not the beating, maybe not the keeping... You know, they were going to put him in the box, mm-hmm. get him out of the city, and then take him out. The keeping him in the box was, I don't believe, part of the original plan. Right. I mean, I think some of them were surprised about how far it ended up going, but I think they were all yeah. in on the plan, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and like, once... Because there's the whole thing where they... He discovered that Min had been captured, he breaks out, he kills two warders, and then he gets to be punished. Yeah. And so, like, that wasn't initially in the plan of punishing him for killing the two warders, because obviously that wasn't the plan for them to kill the warders. But Galena had orders to make it harsh. So I'm sure she would have found any... You know, I'm willing to bet that he got out and saw that Min was there because of the actions of a dark friend, or or of the Black Aja. I have to go back and read that scene, but whoever exposed Min to Ran, I bet that was a Black Aja thing. Yeah, that's I, that's probably right. I'd have to read it too. In the same way that, like the I can't remember who it is, but someone takes the hood off her face in the kin, mm. and so the the kin panic because they realize the I said I are coming for them. That's a dark friend. She doesn't like cover her face up well enough. So I mean, that's that's why that's a ways off. That's when the the they get the bowl and they approach the wise ones and all that kind of stuff. Or uh, sorry, they approach the kin. Right. And the kin freak the fuck out because the Aes Sedai are coming. The reason they freak out is one of the dark friends didn't pull her hood far enough up. And so I sort of think of a similar thing here. Or maybe a dark friend was just, quote unquote, incompetent enough to let Rand realize that Min was there with them. Just speculation. Love to check it out when I get there. I looked up this Gaishan that kind of in the background in this scene. She's a Faradarius my Shido that was taken at the Battle of Karheen, and that was about it. Nothing, she didn't really pop up anywhere no. else. No, and that's where you see see sort of the, the far as, far dar as my are definitely more honorable. They don't seem to yeah. violate Jito in the same way that some of the other Shido do. Yeah, there's some pretty good uh, comic relief coming up with that as well. The next thing I had on here was Egwene's wellness check. 
Yeah, the because they don't have delving, apparently. Right. They don't. They can't delve. They don't have healing. Yeah, and so a few of them can channel that they use the. I mean, physical fitness, I guess. Yeah, or like, yeah, some sort of strange version of a physical. <laughs> right. Yeah. Peering into eyes, listening to her heart. Like, those both seem normal, right? That's yeah. modern medicine, right? You look at your eyes to make sure you don't have jaundice. You know, you listen to the heart to make sure it's low beat. You listen to the breathing, make sure there's nothing in the lungs. Um, but they also make her, like, touch her toes until she's dizzy, do jumping jacks. The one that got me is... They poured water over her head? Really? The Aiel poured water? What? You know, that's a good point. Because they, they're always going on about, like, if you spill a drop, you're going to get switched or whipped or whatever. <laughs> and now they're pouring water over her head? Mm-hmm. I couldn't she drank as much as she could hold, but yeah. I, I couldn't get over that one. Did that. That's a good point. I mean, I know they're in the wetlands now, but... True. They still seem to hold uphold those standards, even in the wetlands, though. Maybe just because it's so rare to get water poured over your head, that seems that's like a shock to IEL systems yeah. to do the wellness check. That's the only thing I'd think of is that it is so rare that, that they're going to do it to her. I like that. Yeah. I mean, right. An IEL would really react to getting water poured over their head. Right. You Hell, I react to getting water poured out over my head. <laughs> True. Right? Like, that being a situation, like, cold water on your head, I mean, it must feel good, but... No, that's another good catch. I I never thought about why they. Yeah, I just was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I hadn't thought about it. I was like, of course they did. But now I'm like, yeah, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't dump water. Now you know, but at the same time, like when Rand first goes to the waste, we see Land like pour some water over his head and be like, you need this to cool you down. So like. Yeah, I always kind of wondered about that scene when it happened. Like, I kind of expected somebody in the background to like glare at him or something right right be like don't waste that water but i i really do think that so i a couple of years ago i went on a bike trip and i was drinking water and drinking water and drinking water and it just i was feeling worse and worse and worse and it wasn't helping and then instead of drinking it i tried pouring it over my head and that immediately made all the difference because yeah. drinking it i'd have to process it and sweat it out whereas pouring it over my head skipped all the part where it was like sucking salt out of my system and making me feel like crap I've had that exact same experience with my running, yep. I think in a lot of ways, when you get to a certain level of, like, temperature and heat, it's it's almost more useful to dump the water over your head than it is to drink it. Indeed. Because you're just skipping the sweat cycle. Right, which is totally what Lan's doing there. And I, I, I'm sure the Aiel all understand that, but I still, I was just like, man, somebody's going to make a comment or glare or something. <laughs> Maybe I'm just too obsessed with their with the Aiel water. <laughs> No, and, and I think here we get a, point, uh, a, a line that sort of summarizes the whole point of this chapter, which is, Another year, she thought, and I will run as well as any far as dies my. Which is to say, Egwene has trained to the point where she can almost keep up with someone who was trained to this from birth. Like, she has thrown herself into this so wholeheartedly that she has become Aiel. Yeah. And that, I feel, is really what the point of this chapter is. Before we send her off to go, you know, fix the White Tower, she's basically a wise one, and she's gone through a wise one training. And that's what gives her, it's sort of saying that's what's giving her the edge yep. over the rest of the Aes Sedai. Level up? <laughs> yep, totally, totally. She joined the wise ones in their sweat tent. For once, they did not make her pour water over the hot rocks. Rodera did that, luxuriating in the damp heat as it relaxed her muscles. And that left, and left only because Ruark and two other clan chiefs, Timolin of the Migoma and Indurian of the Kodara, joined them. Tall, massive, graying men with hard, sober faces. That sent her diving out of the tent to hastily wrap her shawl around her. She always expected to hear laughter when she did that, but the Aiel never seemed to understand why she hurried from the sweat tent whenever a man came in. It would have fit right into Aiel humor if they had, but luckily they just did not make the connection for which she was very glad. Gathering the rest of her clothes in her arms from the neat piles outside the sweat tent, she hurried back to her own. The sun was sitting low now, and after a light meal, she was ready to fall asleep, too tired to even think of Teleron Riyadh, too tired to remember most of her dreams, either. That was something the wise ones had been teaching her, but most of those she did remember were about Gawain. Yeah, so my comment that I wrote in my book at the end of that was, yuck. So here's my question for you. 
Do you think that Egwene's dream experience with Gawain influenced her feelings for him in any way? Or do you think they existed before then? Oh, um, so I, I always look at it as kind of like a um, situation where you have an infatuation with somebody and then you find out that they return that those feelings and then that just like really enhances your feelings for them. Right. Um, so, you know, I've had that happen to me a lot of times. Like, oh, oh, she's kind of cute. Uh, you know, I kind of I'm digging her. And then, you know, either a friend of mine will tell me or somehow I find out or I just talk to her and I find out. And then I'm like, oh, she likes me too. And then suddenly, I, you know, there's like this huge boost. So like finding out and... Oh, you've had that experience a lot, have you? Uh, yeah. Way to brag. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't give you shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. All these women, they just find me so attractive. Um, but, and... but so can you imagine how intense that would be, like experiencing how they feel about you? Yeah. I mean, it would increase your feelings so much i i would imagine yeah and, and after this there's no more galad talk after yeah. that dream right yeah yeah i just wanted to say thanks so much for having me on as a guest it has been a blast oh thank you so much for coming on i, had, I really enjoyed talking with you you had a lot of good insights too there was a couple of things in there that i was like i hadn't thought of that mm. so i really appreciate that that was a lot of fun great. thank you so much for coming on awesome yeah no that great episodes thank you yeah, I can't wait. These, like I said, it, it'll probably be a minute before these come out. They're a little, yeah. Since we're recording out of order, I was just say, you know, I I was really excited when you put out this uh, the kind of call for volunteers because prior to that, I had gotten onto that idea about New Spring, and that made me read New Spring again, and I got all excited about that. Nice. And so I'm still hoping that someday down the road you'll do that idea because New Spring is amazing. Holy cow! Uh, the 24 hour new spring stream yeah exactly yeah yeah no and that's i would still love to do it yeah someday down the road maybe or something someday down the road when i you know i i I definitely got overly enthusiastic about it yeah and tried to to push it through without enough planning so (laughs) because i then you know talk around riyadh did their 24 hour stream not talk around riyadh sorry twatcast did their 24 hour stream but they had a bunch of other podcasters helping them out. Mm. And I was like, oh, right. Don't do it yourself. Get help. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but no, I, I, I do. I think I talked about how I, I think we could get New Spring done in like 16 hours or so. Yeah, I think so. And boy, there is a lot of cool content in it. I mean, I'd read it a few times, mm-hmm. but I've read it less than the rest of the series. Me too. And when I went and reread it, just kind of like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll reread. I was like, there is so much podcast material in this. It, wow. Right. Right. So for me, it's just finding the right time, the right partner, and the right the right group to, to do that. And that's, SpoilerCon has been demanding most of my attention. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bambi says 16 hours plus bullshitting oh. time. Basically, yeah. So 28 hours? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so 32? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because let's be honest, it's mostly bullshit, right? Indeed, but that's the fun part. I mean, well, yeah, no, 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 no. The Wheel of Time is the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, talking about the Wheel of Time is the fun part. That's true. I mean, as much as I love reading it, like, I also really love talking. Obviously, I love talking about it, in case you hadn't noticed. For the I last 300-ish hours. Somehow noticed that. <laughs> interested in uh sound and recording and music and stuff like that but i've i've always been i've always had something that was just a little ahead of it and i've never really dug into it very much and that's part of the reason why i don't know nine months ago or so i messaged you up and said hey what kind of microphone should i buy because i just wanted a nice microphone yeah yeah and we talked we talked through a couple of options right we did yeah and i decided to get this blue yeti just because uh, i don't know 
based on what you said, I was like, oh, that sounds good. And I didn't want to spend a bunch of time. Uh, right. But it's been great. And the funny thing is, like, I don't know, maybe like three or four weeks after that happened, then COVID happened. Here I am working from home suddenly and I needed a good microphone. And it was perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I've, I've been so happy to have this good microphone because people can actually hear me. Yeah. Yeah. When I talk to them on like Zoom calls and stuff. And so many times you're on someone with a phone call and you're like, what the fuck are you saying? Like, right. I actually, I, I ended up after I got this microphone, I got rid of my landline phone that I had, uh, you know, gotten somewhat recently because I didn't have one, but I had needed to get one to make some different calls and stuff. And I just started a Google Voice, you know, what do you, whatever you call that, a Google a Voice over IP phone line. And with this microphone, the quality is a hundred times better than a landline phone. I was amazed. Mm-hmm. You know, and what I found is even when I call my mom, uh, we both have iPhones. And so I call her over FaceTime, but mm. not video, just FaceTime voice, oh, okay. which, by the way, is the dumbest fucking name for a call. FaceTime voice. Right. <laughs> Are you kidding me? OK, Apple, get your shit together. <laughs> anyway, but FaceTime voice is, is what I because she just picks it up. She thinks it's a phone call. And all of a sudden, we go from, and she lives in kind of a rural area with not out good service. OK. And so, you know, we go from like dropping words, crackly noise to just crystal clear the way I'm talking to you. You know, wow. it's like just in my ear. So, I have to try that because I talk to my parents on my iPhone and they also have an iPhone and I can I can't hear anything they say and it's horrible. Yeah, no, because and they're terrible about phone discipline and stuff like that. But the the reality is the the iPhones have great mics and great software processing. It's just the transmission over the the phone lines is terrible. Yeah, uh, and if you use if you use FaceTime chat, which is optimized for the phones, they they have great noise cancellation. They have just crystal clear, almost too clear. Wow. Um, audio. It's like got that. It's got maybe the sharpness turned up a little bit, a little more than I'd like. Gotcha. I wouldn't mind it if they soft softened it up a little bit, but that's a preference thing. I'm gonna um, try that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, it's great. It's great. And and my mom was like, I don't want to do FaceTime. I don't want you to be able to see me. I'm like, no, just the voice, just the audio. Huh. And it's like kind of buried deep in the settings as well, so you kind of have to you have to find it. Okay. It's like you can't, yeah. You know, but because also she was she went through some cancer treatment, and so she was having some trouble really enunciating. Gotcha. So the enunciation plus the bad connection plus she had a case on her phone that sort of kind of muffled the, yeah, the microphone. Yeah. That's familiar. <laughs> yeah. You know, and she's like, well, it's a nice leather case. I'm like, yeah, but it's blocking your microphone and no one can hear you. Um, you need to get a better case. My parents have like eight year old iPhones and they have these crazy cases to protect them. And I'm like, just get a new phone. <laughs> right. Right. It's not that, not that big of a deal. So, She's good now. She's got a new phone and everything, and and that combined with the the FaceTime really ch- changed our whole conversation. Because I would like, I would get five minutes in the conversation, and I'd be frustrated, and mm. she'd be like, "Why are you frustrated with me?" I'm like, "Cause I can't hear you. I'm not frustrated yes. with you. I'm frustrated with the phone call." Yes, I, I relate to that so much. I'm so excited to to try this out. Yeah, especially right now because I I don't see them because of COVID, so I want to be able to talk to them on the phone. Yeah, no, hopefully that works for you. Let me know. And let me know if you need any any help. But it's like, because I have to go into, con- I had to go into contacts and then it's got like uh, FaceTime and then you have to like hit the down button and it's got like FaceTime audio and it's a little, little okay. headset. So it's, yeah, I'm sure internet will tell you how to, how to get to it. Yeah. That's also why I never call my dad because he's, he's got a an Android and oh. <laughs> uh, I can't, can't hear more shit. <laughs> But he texts now. He figured out finally how to text, uh, which is mostly um, what I do. But it's nice to hear. Yeah. Th- it's nice to hear their voice. It is. It is. But if I want to call my dad, I call my mom and say, "Hand the phone to dad." There you go. Yep. Like sometimes I'm like, I just want to watch a movie with my kid. Let's see. Let's let's look up this movie, and it's like impossible to find. There's no blockbuster you can go down to anymore. There's like the Red Box, but it has twelve things in it, and I, you know I just can't find it a lot of times. And that and that's why I, I've you know for a while there I st- I also stopped about ten years ago because I was like oh Netflix is great I'll totally just use Netflix for everything um, and then they discovered that Netflix was successful and started to I don't want to say diversify fracture the yeah landscape and like just turn streaming services into another version of cable and another and 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 created a bunch of artificial rarity indeed yeah. But and a big part of that is like n- there's a lot of things that are on none of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
So you you can buy the Blu-ray, but I don't even I don't have a Blu-ray player. I don't have a I don't even have any of that stuff anymore. I got rid of it all. Right. And I just don't have physical media. I don't really keep physical books. I don't really keep physical you know copies of DVDs or MP or uh, copies of MP3s, copies of CDs. Um, you know, I live the millennial lifestyle. I move every six months. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, same here except books i have a lot of books still i regret making the choice to get rid of all my books i bet <laughs> i did it at the time i understand why i did it and i do think like i'm w- not sure i could have made it out to portland with all my books but god damn that i still think about that shop owner's eyes when i started bringing in box after box after box oh, of, fan- of complete fantasy series his eyes just got wider and wider and oh, wider oh, with every box i brought in I he, and, like he kept imagine. asking me like are you sure like are you really sure and i was like yeah but uh yeah of all the stuff i got rid of my collection of books is the only thing i regret yeah well i can understand that that that's just painful to listen to <laughs> <sighs> you know when somebody when some people get depressed, they shave their head. I give away my books. So, <laughs> um, Ogier, I'm actually in no way tied to the tactile feel of a uh, physical book. I like kind of like the smell, but like I don't feel the need to hold paper. Um, tra- you know, for me, I have always loved sci-fi where they had, you know, tr- like in Star Trek where they had the pads. What are they called? They're not iPads. The 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 yeah, I forget. I don't remember. Not the tricorders, because the tricorders. Data pad. Yeah. Data pad. Like, I looked at a data pad and said, oh my god, you could keep infinite books on there. That would be the best thing ever. That's what I want. And now I have a Kindle. Yeah, same. I just, I like it all. I like audiobooks. I like physical books. I like Kindle. I, I like to just go back and forth through all of them. Sure. No, it's, it's definitely, I'll switch between them all. And often when I'm with other people, I like to read uh, pull out the paper book and show them things yeah for sure but yeah i remember uh, that's that's good you know good point like my hand used to cramp holding those books right like they were heavy you know how many times i fall asleep and like drop a book on my face it hurts <laughs> especially a real time book they're huge i'm experiencing that right now reading it to my son it's like after about 10 15 minutes i'm like okay <laughs> mm-hmm. but i still i still use the physical copy to read to him and I feel like with kids, that's important yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, everything from the picture books. They Kids are very tactile, very three-dimensional. They're still forming their brains. You know, you want, you want them to experience the physicality of things as much as possible. Yeah, definitely. One of my favorite things with him is every time we get to a new chapter, he wants to see the chapter heading. And then he, and then he wants to talk about it. He's like, well, what does that mean? And I'm like, oh, this is just like the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's exactly what we do. So when, when are you gonna sh- when are you gonna play in the podcast? That's the question. Oh, good question. Well, he's got to finish the series first, right? Clearly, yeah. clearly, yeah. So that's, that's very important. That'll be a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need to read faster, is what that what it boils down to. Oh man, I read to him like ten to twenty minutes every night. That's gonna take a long time. Uh, you need to extend that to like thirty to forty minutes, I think. Yeah, probably. <laughs> There's only so much time in the day, man. I, yeah, yeah. But reading should be a priority. I agree. What's his name again? His name's Ken. Ken, I don't actually think I got that the first time. Yeah, I don't think I said it. <laughs> no. Nope. Um, well, uh, and I can t- cut that out of the episode if you want. No, no, no that's care. fine. He's actually been on okay. another podcast already. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. For, well, what did he do? He is very interested in Teslas, so he follows a Tesla... Uh, podcast. Uh, I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but um, he listens to that one every weekend and um, he's called in a couple of times and um, uh, one time they put him on with his question and uh, he recorded it on this lovely microphone that you recommended to me. Oh, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. No, I, I love, I like to hear that he's in the podcast. That's you know, my next generation of customers right there. You're, you're bringing them up. There you go. He's uh, on his way. The... <laughs> I, I, you know, we didn't talk about the TV show at all. Are you excited for that? Oh, so excited. I mean, really, that's what led me here. You know, I kind of told my story about uh, getting into the podcast. But what, what 
led me to all of that in the first place was that the TV show was coming up and I thought, let's let's jump on to some things online and see what's going on. And that's how I found, uh, you know, eventually got to the podcast through through the story I told earlier. So, well, how did you hear about the TV show for the first time? Uh, man, I don't remember anymore, but it's been a couple of years now. I just saw it on a reference somewhere. I mean, okay, so first, of course, I saw the awful rights keeping midnight <laughs> airing of whatever that was the called Winter, Winter Dragon. Dragon. Uh, and I actually stayed up and watched that when it actually came out, and I was just like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> I didn't hear about it until much later, fortunately. Uh, okay. But, yeah. And then yeah, it was bad. I've always kept my my tabs on it because I've always I've just thought like, man, this series is so huge, it's impossible to adapt. Mm-hmm. And I've really been following along, and I'm I'm I you know I hate to put my hopes too high, but I'm super optimistic based on what I've seen. I'm right there with you. I don't want I want I don't want my hopes to get up too high, but I'm really excited about what I've. What the, the the quality of the actors, yeah. the quality of the the passion of the people involved, the quality of the directors, every everything seems to be pointing towards this being a good TV show. I yeah, I agree. And man, I've just been enjoying following along, and I really like that they are you know not too much, but just a little bit engaging the fans and you know doing the what wednesday thing and yeah, everything i could use a lot more of that i could use a lot more too but i'm glad they're doing a little bit of it and um you know i followed up uh sarah nakamura on twitter and uh uh rafe and uh or is it rafe or rafe i don't know and uh rafe, rafe. That's how they pronounce it and uh, you know a few other few other folks uh it, actors in the show and whatnot so i'm always on top of that when they put stuff out do you know ran's actor's name uh uh yosha yosha or something yosha yeah Yeah. which is it it looks kind of like josh i mean it's obviously a j instead of a a, a, so it's almost like a misspelled joshua but it's yosha yeah and so i've been following him he hasn't put too much stuff out really no he hasn't actually now that i think about it he did some in the very beginning okay yeah and didn't he put out uh the jim weaves is the jim wills recently oh yeah that's right i saw that that was good yeah that was fun so he, he does like more gym shots than anything else I think I've seen out of him. I did enjoy the actor that plays Matt, his kind of going wild on social media during their, when they weren't filming. Right. And then it all, For like two weeks, it all came down at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, you got shut down by a PR team, buddy. And that is, that is a disappointment I've seen. I've seen a lot of posts taken down by the actors and I'm like, mm, come on guys, just let yeah. them interact. Stop, stop shutting these actors down. I would really like to see them a little more. Yeah. It's not like they've done freedom. anything really revealing or anything. I mean, no. the, the official releases have mostly been more revealing than anything they've done. Yo, yeah, definitely. No, I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, when the first season comes out and they can actually start talking about what they did in the first season and we can have like yeah. interactions with them. Yeah. That'll Cause be right cool. now everything's hush hush. I'm also looking forward to the podcast talking about that once it comes out. I mean, I don't know how much you'll go into that, but even just the little bits into the, the episodes themselves. Uh, yeah. I mean like, you know, once the show comes out, I'm sure even if you're not like going into each episode in depth, I'm sure you'll be talking about it in the, in the oh. intro and whatnot. We'll be going into each episode in depth. Oh, I, have, I I will definitely. Amazing. Um, I can't imagine. I, you know, I think a lot of the what we do with it might depend on how they release it as well. Yeah, I really hope for weekly. Because, like, you know, what the the Amazon did with the boys is they dropped the three episodes of season two of the boys at once, and then they released the rest of the eight up, you know, five more episodes weekly. Gotcha. So it was three, then one, 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 one every week. Yeah, that'd be good. I mean, I'd like them all weekly, really, but I just... I would do, yeah. It was so fun with Game of Thrones, especially at the beginning. You know, I would get together with a bunch of people each week and watch, and then all week we would talk about it. And Yeah, the weekly watch party is a thing. Yeah. And that's that's the other thing I'd like to do. If we have weekly, I'd love to do, like, a watch spoilers weekly watch, even if we're just all on Discord watching at the same time. That would be awesome. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?